If you look at the back of your program, you'll see Stephen Howard, and he's holding a completely deflated basketball. The defla deflated basketball stems from an instance after he had retired from playing professional basketball when he was packing for a trip and he noticed the deflated basketball languishing in a corner of his closet. Stephen realized that the air was out of his career just like it was out of that basketball as far as professional basketball goes. But he also realized that he was well on the way to breathing life into another career as a public speaker and as a national sports commentator. Stephen, as Thunder fans, believe me, we are very familiar with the deflated basketball because the air has certainly gone out of our season for this year. Raised in a Dallas home by a mother who was a school principal and a, and a father who I think still is a high school counselor, Stephen grew as a student as well as a basketball player. So it was no surprise that he became DePaul University's first academic All-American basketball player. His NBA career included playing for the Utah Jazz, the Seattle Supersonics, and the San Antonio Spurs. Stephen now works for ESPN as a college basketball analyst and for Fox Sports Southwest as the studio analyst of the New Orleans Pelicans. Folks, let's welcome Stephen Howard. I just wanted to say, um, initially when they were talking about Texas and, and me, when I was little, my, my, my parents, both of whom are educators, my, my dad was going to school in Durant and I was really little and he always tells me that I lived, my room was a little closet, so I do have a little bit of Oklahoma in me, so it's not that bad that I'm over here. Um, thank you for that warm welcome, that was about five minutes ago. Um, I appreciate uh, being here and being a part of this uh, great awards presentation about ethics in, um, in Oklahoma. And I think it's really special that you guys had this. Um, and and w when I was reading about it, it, it was very interesting. And I think it's indicative of really the, the Oklahoma, uh, just what it makes to be an Oklahomian. So that's a great, great job, great organization. And you know, let's give a, another round of applause to all the award recipients, because it's a great accomplishment. So I had a, um, a little bit awkward when I was getting introduced, I had a slight ethical dilemma myself. Um, I don't know if, if he, they talked about, you know, the part of my past with the Thunder, but, um, you know, I'm an ESPN college basketball analyst, and my other job is I'm the studio pre and post game analyst of the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, <laughs> that in the last game of the season, uh, knocked the Thunder out of the playoffs with an improbable victory over the San Antonio Spurs. And so I was thinking it, when Mr. Womack called me about my introduction and we were talking about it, I said, you know, you don't need to really mention that part. And <laughs> he starts talking about, well, this is, you know, an, a, a conference on ethics and integrity. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> You know, what's all that about? But, but I will say my first job, though, was an ESPN analyst. And um, I started doing that about seven years ago um, when Kevin Durant was drafted out of, out of the University of Texas. And so I followed him, and I followed his career. And, you know, he's a, a tremendous player. Um, but one of the reasons why I was a little bit nervous about that, the, my Pelicans background is because four years ago I was the studio analyst of the Oklahoma City Thunder when they went to the finals 
uh, versus the uh, Miami Heat. And in that time, I learned about Thunder Fan, and I learned that the Thunder fans really, and this isn't just because I don't want to get hurt in this presentation, <laughs> but the Thunder fans really are, they stand alone in the NBA as far as the best fans, the, the most supportive fans. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love how, you know, before every game, they stand until the Thunder score. Um, totally different atmosphere in New Orleans. You know, they have a late coming, I mean, it's the big easy, so they late coming crowd. And it really wasn't until the playoffs that I saw like true fans. And I remember it was the, uh, the first game and, and they were standing, you know, at the very beginning. I'm like, wow, I wonder if they're gonna, you know, try to start a new tradition when they stand until the, you know, the Pelican score. Uh, but they kept standing and, um, so maybe they hadn't gotten the when they score you sit down part, but still, <laughs> they were cheering. So it, it, was a, it was a good thing. It was a good thing. Um, you know, when you played in the NBA like I have and you're not a Hall of Fame NBA guy like I am not, you, you tend to not follow a certain team. You tend to follow players or, or coaches. You know, you root for individual guys. And that's one of the reasons why I, I root for Kevin Durant because, you know, when it comes to work ethic and, and being a teammate, um, he's really among the tops. And you know, as far as efficient playing in the NBA, there really is, is nobody better. Then you get to Russell Westbrook. And let me say, I'm a huge, huge Russell Westbrook fan. I actually call him Angry Russell, um, <laughs> which you, know, you guys will understand where I'm, I'm coming from, the way that he played this year. I've never really understood why there's so much Russell Westbrook hate out there um, until this year. Now in basketball, like in most sports, you have the purest in, in your sport. Um, guys that, um, they wanna put everything in a box. Um, and you know, in basketball, you have the point guard, the shooting guard, the small forward, the power forward, uh, the center. Russell Westbrook really doesn't fit in any of those guard positions. He's not a point guard. Um, you know Russell, he's trying to do other things other than get other people the ball. Um, he's not a scoring guard because he's, he's too short really to be a, a, sh a shooting guard. He's not a small forward. So he really doesn't fit into any of those boxes. Now one thing about Russell Westbrook though is his will to win for me is really unmatched in the NBA. And uh, there's a lot of players that really espouse what Michael Jordan was about, greatest player of all time. Um, you, Kobe Bryant has that mentality um, but the only player that I've seen that has that will to win, like Michael Jordan, is, is Russell Westbrook. I mean, there's nothing else that he cares about except winning. Um, and so he doesn't fit into a box, but that will to win really separates him from everyone. And I think that's really what upsets those purists, because we can't make him a point guard, we can't make him a shooting guard, what is he? Well, we, we can't figure anything out, so let's just not like him. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand it. Basketball has gray areas. What's a, gray, what's a great play to me might be an okay play to you. Just like I think Russell Westbrook's an awesome player than those people that just hate him. There's those gray areas. Um, I have no problem with that, you know, the ob objectivity of the sport. I don't have a problem with that. The, the basketball purists, they do. Now there is a part of basketball that isn't gray, the rules. You know, we got the 94 feet, uh, the rims 10 inches, 24 second clock, three second clock. I see some of you shaking your head like, what about traveling? <laughs> see, how do I explain this? Traveling in the NBA, it's kind of like traffic signs in Europe. <laughs> it's more like a suggestion. <laughs> we would like for you to only take two steps, please. <laughs> if not, okay. Then it depends on if you're a star or not. Then you can take five if you need that to get to the rim, LeBron James. <laughs> now, just like in your business, in the businesses that are celebrating here for excelling in ethics, you know, those rules, those laws are really the foundation of what makes your business and, and what makes you exceptional in your business. Uh, those are the foundation of your business, the foundation of your game. And really when you're creating 
or an organization, when you're creating a, a team, you, you really start from the ground up. You know, and, and you, you create those guiding principles that are going to lead you throughout really the, the building of your organization, of your team. You know, I want to have the, the fastest team out there, or I want to be the most physical team. I just want to be focused on defense. And then after that, you decide the, the people that you want to be a part of your organization or your team. You know, I just want winners. All right, well, I want people with an edge to them. Or I want them to be lean and mean. You know, once you figure that out, then you move forward, and you move forward with your organization. I had an opportunity to play for the San Antonio Spurs 96-97 season, and never in my life, and even since then, have I seen a team that's been more hamstring or snake bitten by injuries, even more so than the Thunder this year. I mean, on that team, you had David Robinson, Dominique Wilkins, Vinny Del Negro, Chuck Person. And at one point of the season, they all were hurt, and sometimes all of them at the same time. So obviously, that team struggled. Um, they lost a lot of games, and they found themselves in the lottery. And we're fortunate enough to get Tim Duncan. The rest is history. So in some warped way, I feel like I have a great deal to do with the success of the Spurs because, <laughs> I mean, really, seriously, they should be sending me royalty checks or something every, every year. I, I mean, I helped them get Tim Duncan. I helped them with one of their worst seasons ever. Um, so that's my contribution. So Tim and I are kind of linked at the hip. But one of the reasons why the Spurs are so successful is because they have that strong culture. Not only is their culture about winning, but if you dig deeper, it's how they win. You know, you got ball movement, execution, uh, defensive principles, but really most important to me is you got high character guys, much like you do here with the Oklahoma City Thunder. When I look at the, the guiding principles of this consortium, a lot of them really resonate with sports and, and with basketball. Responsibility to self and others. When's the last time you heard of a Thunder player getting in trouble in the news? And if you did hear that, you knew that they weren't going to be a Thunder player much longer. <laughs> Service. You know, they all put their franchise in front of themselves. I, I saw a story recently where Russell Westbrook gave uh, the car that he won for being the MVP to a single mom who was finishing school. Um, things like that. Collaboration. Russell Westbrook. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I do love Russell Westbrook, but that guy plays 82 games with a chip on his shoulder. Do you know how difficult it is to play 82 games with a chip on your shoulder? That'd be like every day of the year, you guys waking up for work like, whoo, I'm gonna kill it. <laughs> yes. You all know that there's some days when you just don't got it. And I don't know how he does it. I don't know if he's got one of his boys or someone that calls him before the game like, dude, you will not believe what Kobe said about your mom. <laughs> what? <laughs> then the next game, like, man, you're not gonna believe this. James Harden has been killing your mom on social media. What? It's gotta be something like that, because I, I don't know how, I mean, he gets the, the tip, he's angry. And he, there's nothing else in his way. I don't know how he does it. It's really amazing. But the guy has got focus like nobody I've ever, I've ever seen. OK, I got sidetracked on Russell there. But collaboration. <laughs> and there I go back to the Spurs. I don't really know who dubbed the Spurs as boring basketball. Whoever did that really doesn't know anything about basketball because they're all about the essentials, the foundation of basketball. You got the. Uh, execution, the ball movement, really one of the best passing teams ever in the NBA. Um, I don't know who thinks winning is boring, but they're basically the gold standing in the M NBA for winning. Respect. Respect for their coach, players, teammates. I know a lot of you saw when um, Scott Brooks were fired, um, was fired, Kevin Durant put something out on social media about how much he respected him, how much he helped him grow, um, while also being behind the decision of 100%. You know, as for a coach, they loved him, but, you know, they have to move on. Uh, but that respect of him and, and what he brought to them was there. 
Lead with integrity. How you lead is really going to determine how I follow. You know, you really can't expect your employees to work with integrity, ethics, character, if the management is at the golf course all day long, or the management doesn't espouse those same values. Dependability. I'll go back to the Spurs and, and Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan's 38 years old. He's rolled back the clock. Last two weeks of the NBA season, he was averaging 25 and 10. Repeatedly during these NBA playoffs, he's been playing like the 28-year-old Timmy and not the 38-year-old. They can depend on him. You know, you could look at even the Thunder. Kevin Durant played all season long with that foot injury. Russell Westbrook played with a dent in his face. I mean, these guys were dependable. The teammates knew, hey, these guys are going to be there for us. Initiative. Look, the Thunder, they know what they have to do in order to win, and they go out there and do it. Honor. Always being in that mode of continual learning, always getting better as a player, as a team, as a person, on and off the court. Courage. The Spurs, people say that they're boring. They play the game the right way. They play the game their way. They do not care what you think about the way they play. And lastly, inspire trust. That's the one thing I, I, I love about great teams is they trust each other. And they trust the system. They trust the coach. And, you know, when you watch great basketball teams, you go into the fourth quarter. And regardless of what the score is throughout the game, I always say that the NBA is like a video game. They have the autocorrect. So once you get to the fourth quarter, it's always going to be a close basketball game. And in that fourth quarter, everybody has to execute. Everybody has to be on the same page or you're going to lose a basketball game. Offensively, you come down, you need to get that shot. There's a pin down on this side. You got to come out hard. The person that screens has to set a great screen. If that option's not over, there's a flash to the ball on the other side. He's a release valve. If all that stuff doesn't work just like you practiced it every, every time, if one player's tired this play or upset because he didn't get the ball, you're not going to score. And if repeatedly you don't score, you're going to lose the basketball game. Same thing on, on defense. You got those defensive principles. We're going to double team um, Kevin Durant on the first dribble or on the catch. Uh, we're going to go and we're going to play zone after 10 seconds. If everybody doesn't play strict adherence to those rules, you're going to lose basketball games. You lose basketball games, you don't make the playoffs. You don't make the playoff, the coach gets fired. Uh, you repeatedly don't make the playoffs, the GM gets fired. Then we're cleaning a house, everybody, there's a whole new front office. Same thing in your business. You have an employee that finds a shortcut to do his work. He tells his buddy, hey, I got a shortcut to do work. Let's do this, we can get out here early, you go hit the golf course. Our manager's there anyway. Yeah. <laughs> then they tell some other employees, and then the product, you know, starts to uh, not be, be the same standards as it was before. Customer service falters. The money starts to decline. The board recognizes this. They fire a couple managers, mix it up. It continues to decline, and then they get a new CEO. They bring in a whole new shop. Then you get bought out by Walmart. Then you know what happens. Successful companies are really built on the backs of morality, ex ethics, and character. You know, let's be honest. There, there's people, there's corporations that have really sold out for money. And they've been successful for a while, but that success is never sustained. It's never long-lived. The, really, the trick to be a successful, long-lived company is the way you go about your business, those ethics, the character of your company, of your employees. And that's why I applaud everybody that's here right now, because you espouse those beliefs. You know, my father told me when I was young something that he repeated throughout my youth that really there's never a right time to do the wrong thing. And I always hear that in my head, never a right time to do the wrong thing. Speaking of my dad, like to, to know me and to really to know anyone, you have to know where they come from. And as Oscar told you in my introduction, uh, both of my parents were educators, teachers. 
really, my whole family is in education. My grandmother was a teacher. I have aunts and uncles on, on both sides that are in education still now. My dad was a high school counselor. My mom was a middle school principal. And I was really raised that the right way really was the only way to do things. I told my friend something about my dad recently, and, and it just blew her mind. She didn't believe me. And I said, to this day, I've never heard my dad use a curse word. When my mom would talk about the, the nether region, she would say H-E-double-L. Um, I'm not saying that my parents are better than yours. <laughs> but, you know, that's just the way that I was raised. Um, and, you know, those little things, when you're little, you know, it might not resonate as much when you grow older. Uh, those are the things that really stick out. There was a, a culture of learning in my house, and it made it so that learning was really continuous, and, and it never stopped. I remember when I was ele in elementary, I don't remember when exactly this happened, but it was in, during the summer. I was going out to uh, play in the park somewhere, maybe go play basketball somewhere, so I left my mom a note. Hey, mom, I'm going to the park, be back, blah, blah, blah. So I go, and I come back later on, and you know, I'm walking by the kitchen table. There's red marks on my note to my mom. She had corrected and graded my note. Really? So I developed a little complex where I would just be like, Mom, gone, Stephen, you know. But really what my, my mom and my dad were teaching me is that really every day is filled with multiple teachable moments. And that there are so many things that you can learn from a day. Now when your parents are educators, I mean, the teachable moments never cease. I mean, there's no summer break. There's no Christmas vacation. Uh, there's no summer break. I mean, I'm always doing workbooks, SAT preps, something. Um, summer school, even if I didn't get a bad grade, because this is something, you know, we know you struggle with. Well, the teachers didn't say that I got a good grade. Well, you know, you know. But those teachable moments um, that I had really growing up, eventually I, I started to learn to embrace those um, and embracing that continual learning that process that my parents as educators really threw on me. Now my dad, my dad's a strong, silent type. He doesn't really talk a lot, but when he says something, you listen because it holds a lot of weight. Um, and he taught me something with that, that the less that you speak, the more equity that your words have. Now clearly, I didn't learn that much from that as a TV broadcaster and a speaker, but I remember the lesson. Um, I remember in high school, my dad got called to jury duty. Um, anyone in here that likes going to jury duty? Raise your hand. Let's be honest, ethics here. Oh, okay. That, anyone here likes to go to jury duty? Okay, so my dad is the only person I've ever met in my life that likes to go to jury duty. He feels it's his obligation as a taxpayer, American citizen. Um, really, my dad's an amazing person. And so he was on jury duty, and it was for like over a week. And so I'm asking him, like, hey, you know, what's this, you know, trial about? He said, well, I can tell you after it's over. <laughs> really, Dad? This is not the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> You're not on the presidential impeachment, you know, trial. You're not sequestered as far as I know. You know, you can't tell me, but, you know, that's, that's my dad. He, he follows the, the rules to the law, and you know, regardless of, of what was going on, you know, he's going to follow the rules. I, I'm probably the guy when they're picking out the drawers and they're like, well, what do you feel about giving this sort of a sentence? Death penalty! <laughs> well, this is just for a red light violation, <laughs> sir. Oh, oh, excuse me, I must be in the wrong room. I'm sorry. Um, there's a story I, I heard recently. There's a man, he was on a horse, he was going down a road, and he, come, he came to a fork in the road. In the middle of the, the fork, there was a cat, a 
okay, work with me with this part. There's a cat in the middle of the road. So the man asked the cat, which way should I go? The cat asked the man, well, where are you going? The man replied, I don't know. The cat said, well, it really doesn't matter. You know, if you don't know where you're going and how you're going to get there, it really doesn't matter. You know, you're going to have issues with ethics and questions on how to do things. And if you ask yourself where you're going, those are going to answer a lot of your questions. Now, these little conversations with my parents and these little examples that my parents would give me, they really taught me a lot about ethics and character, integrity. Um, they planted seeds in me uh, that they hoped would blossom. Just like your corporations, you, you plant seeds with your employees, with the internal memos, the workshops, the retreats. Um, that constant reinforcement of what's right, the constant reinforcement of the values of the company that you want your employees from the top to the bottom to espouse. Now, I'm sure most of you think growing up I was a stud. <laughs> or you should, no. Um, if, you, if you do, if you did think that, you were wrong. I was that awkward, shy, clumsy kid that was always falling into his locker um, that you were like, wow, look at that kid. I hope he gets out of high school alive. Um, that was me. Uh, but I started to really grow into my body um, and figure things out like the, the latter part of my freshman year. And so by the time I was a sophomore, I started to, you know, figure it out a little bit athletically. There was a buzz about me in, in the city of Dallas uh, outside of my little private school. So I was starting to, you know, feel it a little bit. So, I remember I came home one day um, that sophomore year, and I, I saw my parents sitting on the couch together. You know when your spidey scent starts going off a little bit? <laughs> it was just a little odd. So then, you know, my mom says, you know, can you sit here on the couch? Red flag. That, that's when you're like, what is it called, the fight or flight? Like, <laughs> it was something in my mind like, run, forest. So I sat down and my parents had my report card in their hand. And that's when you're like, you missed your chance to live. Like, <laughs> like something told you to run, you know, you got to listen to that. So I'm sitting there and so my mom, she starts out and she starts out apologizing to me. She said, look, son, your dad and I want to apologize to you. We put too much on your plate. See here that you got a C on your report card. And so we're going to help you out. We're going to take some stuff off, off your plate. Wow. This did not go how I thought it was going to go. This is not bad. So she said, all right, on your next report card, if there's a C anywhere on your report card, even in the spelling of a name, which is difficult because Christopher is my middle name, so I don't know. But if there's a C anywhere on the report card, even in the spelling of a name, you will not play sports for the rest of that year. What? Are you guys drunk? Are you guys crazy? Are you, have, have you guys gone bananas? Clearly I did not say any of that. <laughs> but I thought it. So I did what any normal high school kid would do. I stormed up, went in my room, and I slammed the door as softly as you could. Turned on my boom box. See a lot of you older people nodding your head, you know exactly what that is. <laughs> Found some Lionel Richie and some Luther Vandross and I had myself a pity party. And I know all you know about that pity party. And I found the most depressing, sad songs on those albums and I listened to those over and over and over again. And just had myself a good old fashioned, awesome pity party. Now, after that was over, I knew I had a decision I had to make. Because my parents weren't those type that were just bluffing and, you know, I got to get a C that next time and, okay, we see you're trying. No, they said what they meant and they meant what they said. So I had a decision. Was I going to give up and say, hey, school's just not my thing and I guess sports isn't my thing either? Or was I going to buck up and fight it? So I decided, hey, you know what? 
I'm going to put that same passion into the classroom that I'd put into sports. I'm going to try to excel the exact same way that I did in the classroom that I did in, on the court. But it's easy to say that. I mean, I had a C. C's average. It's not bad, but it wasn't mastery of Spanish. So how was I going to do that? Was I going to bust my behind and do extra work and get extra credit with the teacher and um, ask for help? I could cheat. I could you know, get the answers. I could have Sally next to me with the big four-inch magnifying glasses, you know, eyes that thought I was cute. No, nobody thought I was cute in high school. That was a little fib. Uh, and ask her for the answers or maybe cheat off her in the test. I mean, I had options. But then I go back to those seeds that were planted when I was younger. My dad wanted to be a juror, those teachable moments. And so I buckled down. I worked extra hard. And I got better. Um, and I'm not the type of guy that things come easily to, not even in, in athletics. Um, I'm a guy that has to work twice as hard for everything. Um, but the one thing I learned about myself is that I liked that. I liked that feeling of hard work and then you see the results of your hard work. I loved at the end of a workout thinking, wow, I had a tough workout today and I made it through it. And that transferred over to school when I would be up all night studying and then I get the test report back and I got an A. I loved that feeling. Now, what I didn't like was not succeeding. And so, with everything out there, there's a choice. There's a choice in what you're going to do. At that moment, my whole attitude about life really changed. All the lessons, those seeds that my parents had planted, integrity, ethics, character, they blossomed. So after I decided to apply myself in school and really had that same passion in everything that I did, I never got another C. Not in high school, not in college. In fact, I was in the dean's list every academic quarter at DePaul University. That choice I made, thank you for that one applause, I appreciate that. <laughs> I have a speech next week, um, could you, be, it's in Dallas, but I'm gonna need you there, all right. That choice I made as a sophomore in high school impacted me in high school, it impacted me in college, it impacted me in the NBA, and now it impacts me now with ESPN because there's really no way that I would be working for ESPN right now if I wasn't the only academic All-American to go to DePaul University. Now I've heard a lot of speakers in the past and you know they'll have those success stories of you know I started from the bottom now we're here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that just popped into my head. I don't know why. It is. But I started at the bottom, became successful, was at the top, and I lost my focus, my moral compass, whatever, and then lost everything, lost my family, went back to the bottom. Now I've worked my way up and I'm back at the top. I have nothing against those type of people. Everybody deserves a second chance, but that's not my story. I'm the guy that's done everything right that has stayed on that straight and narrow, and that's been my ticket to success. And there's nothing wrong with that either. It, it doesn't seem like th those type of stories are celebrated as much as the others, which I think that's indicative on our society, but there's nothing wrong with being the good guy. And you know, being the good, being the good guy really should be celebrated. You heard Oscar's introduction talking about uh, my deflated basketball on my website. And FYI, that was before Deflate Gate, so <laughs> I actually have some royalties coming in from Patriots too, so Spurs, now the Patriots. This has been a good year for me. Um, that picture, though, really resonates with everything I talk about. Um, because if you think about it, the air is going to go out of something in your life all the time, whether it be relationships, your job, an ethical situation, because you know once you put out that fire, there's going to be another fire that's going to pop up somewhere else. The more successful you are at de dealing with those 
situations where the air goes out of your ball, the more successful you're going to be. FYI, when the air went out of Russell Westbrook's ball, he got a triple-double. <laughs> he had a dent in his face, and he got a triple-double. So, <laughs> drop mic, you know. <laughs> in college, the air went out of my ball. I had to transition from high school play to a more physical college play, while the academics being more difficult as well, being on your own. When I got to the NBA, air went out of my ball. I had to transition to playing against the best in the world, not being the star. <clears throat> then after my NBA career, my professional basketball career was over, I did, the air really went out. Um, I got a job with ESPN, something I've never done before as far as broadcasting. Um, so I had to transition into that. The air is always going to go out of your life in some situation. How you deal with that is going to determine how successful you are. Now, the average career of an NBA player is a little over, a little over three years. I had a 15-year professional career playing basketball of one-year contracts. Now, do you know what it means to have a 15-year career of one-year contracts? That means every year is a contract year. Every game is a money game. Every shot is a game winner and a game loser. And believe me, there are more game losers than game winners. Do you know what else it means when you've had a 15-year career of one-year contracts? It means you've been cut, waived, or fired a lot. Does anybody know how many times I was cut, waived, or fired in my 15-year career? Well, that was a real question. Didn't you hear the inflection of my voice? <laughs> because I don't know. I stopped counting it at 16. True story. I didn't let getting cut, waved, or fired deter me. I didn't let it deter me from my goal. I didn't let it deter me from what I knew that I had to do, what I could do in my life. So every year, I had to get a new job. Every year, the, the air went out of my basketball career. I didn't know whether or not I was going to have a job. I didn't know whether or not I'd have to call you guys up and get a real job. I didn't know what was going to happen. But I just stayed true to me. You see, I'm not here talking to you because I played in the NBA. I'm not here talking to you because I'm a successful ESPN commentator. I'm here talking to you really right now because I didn't quit. And in large part because of my brand. Stephen Howard Incorporated, me, and how I ran that brand, much like you guys run your corporations, using those same guiding principles of ethics, character, and integrity. You know, in the NBA, I was a fringe player. I was average. Average in the top 1% of the world, I'll take that. That's not bad. <laughs> There's a very small margin between good and great in the NBA. And so if I would have taken some illegal performance enhancers, that would have meant millions of dollars to me. That would have been the difference of a 15-year career of one-year contracts and maybe four three-year contracts, multi-million dollar money. The funny thing to me, I guess it's really not funny, but you know, I think about this all the time, and I thank my parents for that. But I never, I never considered that, not in my whole NBA career. Never once considered doing anything illegal, taking anything illegal, cutting any corners. That wasn't part of my DNA. That wasn't part of the DNA of Howard Incorporated that my parents had instilled with me, those teachable moments, those seeds that they planted. That culture of learning that I grew up in, that always had me to inquire, to try to improve myself. It wouldn't allow that. The air went out of a lot of things during my 15-year career. Um, but those guiding principles, those ethics, they stayed firm. They stayed firm when I didn't have a job. They stayed firm when I was 
struggling for money. They stayed firm when I saw friends of mine sign these huge contracts that I knew that I was better than them. They stayed firm when I was in Europe when I knew I should be playing in the NBA. And I'm just trying to figure out what my teammates are saying, but I knew it couldn't be good because there's a lot of this all the time. <laughs> I don't know what he said, but he doesn't look happy. To... <laughs> and it always goes back to my dad. There's never a right time to do the wrong thing. It's really so simple that it's perfect. There's never a right time to do the wrong thing. Now, I know one thing that everybody in here understands is it's not easy doing the right thing all the time. In school, you're labeled the teacher's pet, the do-gooder. In college, I had all these nicknames, like Professor Howard, and you know, has a different tone than like Dr. J. <laughs> the glove, Durantula, you know, the beard, even though the beard, um, what does that mean? That's really not that great. I mean, you're known for your facial hair. I don't know. Um, so in college, clearly I was always studying. Um, and so it would be a Friday night, and the basketball players in, in our dorm had all the corner rooms. So the stairs were on the right coming up, you know, the fire escape, and then the elevators were on the left. So you could hear when someone was going to come to your room. So I would always be sitting on my couch studying with a book. And until I could hear someone close to my room, I'd put the book down and turn on the TV. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Just watching TV. What do you, oh, there's a party though? Okay, I'll be there. All right. Then they'd leave. I'd turn off the TV, get my book back. I'm already the team nerd. I'm not going to be the guy studying on Friday and Saturday night. So come on now. I had to have some sort of street cred out there. Um, so it, it's not always easy. You know, being that guy that's always doing the right thing. Um, as a professional during the summers, that's when I really would make NBA teams. 15-year career, one-year contract, summer, you know, I knew that I had to be in better shape than everyone. I had to shoot better than everyone. I couldn't get tired. So when everybody else is out partying and having a good time, I'm going to sleep at, at 10 o'clock because I had to get up 5.30, 6 a.m. to go hit the track before that summer blistering Texas sun gave me heat exhaustion. So those sacrifices that I would have to continuously make. Now, even with ESPN, everybody thinks that's a glamour job. Oh, you get to talk sports all the time. That's cool. You get to be on TV. What you don't realize is, just like when I was in the NBA, more times than not, you're going to find me at home at night, either watching games, studying game tape, studying up players, um, their history, the team history what their parents did, personal interest stories. I have to study, and I'll have all this information. In a good game, in the, when you're doing something on, on, on TV, is if you get to use 15% of the information that, that you have. So I just mound information after information just in case I need it. Now, for the most part, I don't, and I'm just exhausted after the game looking at all this stuff like, man, why did you do that? But it's part of the process that I have to have. Now, don't get me wrong, I do have fun, but the majority of the job is built up of a lot of monotonous work um, that does have some fun at the end, that has some icing on the cake, like talking with you guys. I had no idea, though, as a child, the lessons that I was being taught by my parents, the lessons of character, integrity, ethics, and really, I didn't have an idea of what they were teaching me to do. They were teaching me how to run a corporation. Stephen Howard Incorporated, me. I work for ESPN now, which I don't know if you know this, but it's owned by Disney. And there's really no better or famous brand out there than the Disney brand. I mean, you look at their font. You immediately see Walt Disney. You know, even without reading that, that it's Disney. That's their font. A Disney movie, it doesn't even have to say Disney, you know what a Disney movie is. They're theme parks. You know that brand of Disney. They've really perfected running a brand. And what people don't realize is that you're your own brand. You have to run your brand 
just like a corporation. And that's really what my parents were teaching me at an early age. At DePaul University, I was a four-year starter, never got in trouble. I was first team academic All-American in my junior and senior year. As Oscar mentioned, I was the first ever academic All-American, and I'm the last. Good for me, not so good for DePaul. Not only was I smart, but I could play a little basketball. When I graduated, I was top five in scoring and rebounding, um, number one in games played and free throws made. So that told the NBA that I was a hard worker, I was a good basketball player, I was smart, and I wouldn't give them any headaches. Not quite good enough to get drafted, but good enough to get invited to a veterans camp. I said, a uh, veterans camp. One veterans camp. I got invited to veterans camp with the Utah Jazz. Now the Utah Jazz were much like the Spurs before the Spurs. They had a culture with Utah. They had a system. They didn't deal with knuckleheads. Uh, they had high character guys. Um, and with the Jazz, then much like the Spurs now, and even like the Thunder, it's gotta be the guys at the top that espouse those beliefs. Because like I mentioned earlier, you can't have your manager or your owner talking about values and integrity and they're always at, out at the golf course. So you're always reading them about them on, on TMZ, uh, getting in trouble or something. And it's not by accident that you know, these teams are successful. I know when I played with the Utah Jazz, Carl Malone and John Stockton were always the first at practice, the last to leave. We always have to do this health test every year with the Jazz where um, some of you might have done it before when they test your heart rate and they put you on a treadmill and every four minutes they go up. And so John Stockton, every year, would come last. He'd go last. He'd ask the trainer, okay, what time do I have to beat? And he'd get on there and he would beat that time. 18, 19 minutes, 22 minutes. He did that until he retired. I forget what age he retired. I think it was 42 or 43. Now, I remember I would come in there literally in the best shape of my life, and when it would get to about like 10, 11 minutes, that elevation is high, and your back is tightening up, and your body is screaming at you like, really? We don't have something else we could do right now? And so I always think about him like every year just killing that. Um, but he was sending a message to all these young whippersnappers, whoever was coming in, that this is still my team, that this is what training camp's gonna be like, this is what every day is gonna be like, this is how I'm starting the season before it's even going, this is how we're gonna go. They led every drill, they never complained. They held the message when teammates didn't act accordingly, they would be the ones to deliver the message. It, it, it can't always be the coach. So how is the 10th or 12th guy on the bench going to say, I don't feel like practicing today, or I'm tired in the game when the all-star who played 38 minutes the day before is the first guy there leading every drill? Happy to be there because happiness is a choice. My oh, man talked to me about that before. He's so right. Um, you can always tell organizations that have a successful culture as well because they had that same management in place for a while. Back with my Utah Jazz, Jerry Sloan, you know, one of my favorite coaches of all time just because if you worked hard and did things the right way, he was gonna roll with you. He was a coach for the Jazz over 20 years. Much like Popovich is a coach of the Spurs for so long. Much like Scott Brooks is, oh dang, I forgot to change that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I like Scott Brooks, but Billy Dobbins is a great coach. You guys are going to enjoy him as well. Um, but when you have coaches, don't tell Scott I said that either. I like him. <laughs> but when you have coaches or management that's been in place for a long time, that creates that stability and that system where they're able to make that part of the infrastructure, part of the culture. I mean, you see the same thing with the Spurs where Tim Duncan and Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, they set the tone for those teams. KD, Russell Westbrook, they set the tone with the Thunder. Now, after playing in the NBA 
and in Europe and Asia, a little bit in the Middle East. I got a call when I was playing in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was a call from ESPN, and they said, hey, we're going to give you two games, two games the following year. I knew I wasn't that Hall of Fame guy like Charles Barkley or Shaq, that when I retired, they'd have the networks would be fighting over me to offer me a gig. So two games the next year was all it took for me to walk away. I was given those two games to try out with ESPN, not because of my NBA career. I was there for my whole NBA career, and I don't even remember it. <laughs> I was given that opportunity really because I'm the only academic All-American at DePaul University. There was something significant that stood out at me. Not only that, my brand, Stephen Howard Incorporated, matched the brand of Disney, of ABC, of ESPN. They knew I wasn't going to be a knucklehead, give them a headache. I was going to do the right thing. The culture of learning that my parents instituted when I was younger, always trying to better myself, always adhering to the character traits, the ethics that they espouse, that impacted me. And that allowed me to excel in college, in the NBA, and now at ESPN. And when I played professional basketball, I knew my career was going to be finite. I mean, 15-year career, one-year contracts, you never know when that's going to end. And so I knew I had something to fall back on. That something was me, Stephen Howard Incorporated. I ran that corporation with the same ethics, the same integrity and character that you guys espouse in your corporation. Now, the last thing I'm going to leave you guys with is a story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's about a priest in, in revolutionary, pre-revolutionary Russia. He's walking down a road, and a soldier steps out. The soldier points his rifle at the priest and asks him, who are you, where are you going, and why are you going there? Unfazed, the, the priest looked at the soldier and asked him, how much are they paying you? The soldier was kind of surprised, and he, he told him what was equivalent to about $25 a month. So the priest looked at the soldier, and he calmly replied, if I give you $50, will you stop me every day on this road and ask me those same exact three questions? Who are you? Where are you going? And why are you going there? I think about that story often, particularly when I'm having problems or situations I need to work through. And when you ask yourself those questions and you answer them honestly with that internal core that I know all of you have, the questions and the answers are always easy. Now, I applaud everyone in this room tonight. I applaud all the corporations that got the awards and, and everybody that adheres to these same awards because you've created a culture in your corporation. You've created a culture that I know we all help hope trickles down into our society. And I think the only sad thing about this award is the fact that there's not more like them everywhere. And hopefully, you guys can make that happen. Thank you for having me, and I appreciate you uh, having me here.
uh, U.S. Naval Academy. Thank you, Lynn, for arranging that. But June will be, uh, Tulsa will be hosting Jeffrey Roberts with BKD to talk about insights into workplace fraud. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, Dave Hager will be here. He's Chief Operating Officer at Devon Energy. And of course, watch this summer for our uh, mystery uh, prime minister that Warren didn't mention earlier. Thank you for coming.